All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We have a really fantastic presentation for you. My name is Chanel Hasen. I'm the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. And today our uh, webinar is on birds and the kelp forest here in Oregon with awesome local photographer, Roy Lowe. So before I pass it off to Roy, I'm going to just chat a little bit about the Alaka Alliance and who we are. So this photo actually was taken by Roy that I stole off his Flickr channel. So <laughs> thanks Roy for this great little sea otter photograph. Um, but sea otters, if you didn't know, were very plentiful along the entire West Coast from Mexico to Alaska. But now there's an 800 mile gap from Northern California to Northern Washington where sea otters are nowhere to be found. Um, and we know that they have been around for at least 10,000 years off of our West Coast. Uh, here in the Pacific, and they were a really important part of the culture for the people along Oregon's coastline. As you can see here, uh, this is a map of the Oregon coast and the different uh, indigenous tribes that lived along it, and you can see there are multiple names for sea otter. So obviously they were plentiful along our coastline, um, and so there's a very, very strong cultural heritage connection to sea otters, which is very important for the Alaka Alliance because the late David Hatch, who it was a Siletz tribal member of the Ku Sayuslan Aleut descent, was searching for an indigenous name uh, for a dinghy that him and his son Peter were building. And he came across the word Alaka, the first one that you see up there. And that means sea otter. And he was like, well, there's no sea otters here off the coast. Where did they go? Why aren't they here anymore? Um, so that led us down several years later into what we are now, the Alaka Alliance, which is a group of tribal nonprofit and conservation leaders trying to reintroduce this once native keystone species. So kind of going along those lines, our mission is to restore a healthy population of sea otters and in the process help make our Oregon ecosystems more robust and resilient. So we just released a feasibility study um, in late August. And so you can check it out on our website. So basically this is a very thorough document um, from six scientists uh, who uh, answered questions about habitat suitability for sea otter reintroduction in Oregon, um, also potential positive and negative effects on the marine ecosystem and estuary ecosystems, uh, possible social and economic impacts. And so you can find all these chapters, there's 12 chapters on our website. You can download each chapter or download the whole document. If you're feeling that excited to learn more about this process, it is really, really interesting. Um, so check that out on our website. If you haven't, it is open for public comment until the end of November. So if you feel like we're lacking something or have any comments or questions, please use that feedback form. So some utterly exciting updates. Uh, we have our next webinar presentation is on chasing kelp uh, and it's about the bull kelp journey along the Pacific coast and looking back on some historic bull kelp mapping um, with Josie Islin. She's an author and fine art photographer. So you can register for that right now on our website uh, for our next presentation that's on December 1st. And then we also have 15 local Oregon breweries who, who are participating in an Oregon Otter Beer Challenge that we are producing. Um, so I'll send out more information in our next email blast about that. But it's really, really exciting. And we're going to have a judging tasting party in Portland at the end of January. So be on the lookout if you want to participate and be maybe a potential guest judge for that one. And if you haven't already, please check out all our social channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, and if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, it goes out once a month by yours truly. So uh, you can sign up easily via our website. And now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Roy Lowe. 
He's a resident of Waldenport, Oregon, a photographer and former board member of the Alaka Alliance. Thanks, Roy. And he was employed with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for more than 37 years and was the project leader for the Oregon Coast National Wildlife Refuge Complex upon his retirement in 2015. So we're really excited to learn more about birds and kelp from you. Okay, thanks, Janelle. You're welcome. I want to start off tonight uh, with a little sense of place for those of you that maybe haven't traveled the entire Oregon coast. So um, let's start on the south coast. This is a view of uh, Harris Beach on the left there, Brookings in the background. You can see the kelp, uh, kelp forest uh, in the lower portion of the photo here. And on the right is uh, Goat Island, uh, which locals call Island or Bird Island. There it is, Goat Island. It's the largest island in Oregon at 21 acres, and that's Cape Ferrillo in the distance. Moving up the coastline, this is Crook Point, and you can see uh, the, the kelp areas along the, the headlands here and along the reef system. There's an a overview, overview looking down on Crook Point, and you can see the, the, kelp, the kelp forest there with Crook Point, and in the background is Cape Sebastian. This is what it looks like on the, on the water at uh, Crook Point, a really, really nice kelp beds in there. This is the Rogue River Reef, and you can see the, the dark color of the kelp, kelp forest there extending across the reef. And the next photo is kind of a close up here of Pyramid Rock. <clears throat> uh, this rock uh, produces about 500 stellar sea lion pups a year, so it's the largest pupping area in U.S. waters uh, south of Alaska. And you can see the extensive kelp forest there near, near the rock. This is the south side of Humbug Mountain. <clears throat> There's some really beautiful kelp uh, beds along the south side. And if you look at this really smooth water in here, this is all dense kelp forest uh, through here, uh, knocking down the wavelets and making it much smoother there. That's what it looks like uh, on, the, on the water on a different day, of course, and really, really amazing kelp bed. I'd love to go diving under this. That's looking south towards uh, Humbug Mountain, and you can see the, the kelp beds on the, on the water here. And if you go to the right or to the west, uh, you're at the Redfish Rocks uh, Marine Reserve, and you can see some of the, the kelp here. Uh, the, in the foreground here is uh, Orford Reef. In the background, you can see Port uh, or the or Blanco, Cape Blanco, and the Blanco Reef is up in this area. Both support uh, kelp force. And then, in many places along uh, the coastline, the kelp is really specific to rocky areas. This is Cat and Kitten Rocks at um, Bandon. And you can see the kelp surrounding it. The, the flat top rocks are kind of covered black and white, and those are thousands upon thousands of common murders breeding there. Uh, Cape Arabelle in the foreground here. Uh, Simpson Reef, you can start to see all the kelp forest here. Uh, Gregory Point, Chiefs Island, and the mouth of Coos Bay over here. And that's a little bit better look at the kelp uh, forest surrounding uh, the, the Simpson Reef here. And I've been fortunate to see one live sea otter in Oregon in 1993. Uh, there was a sea otter hanging out in this area and undoubtedly a, a wandering animal from Washington State. Uh, this is uh, Gregory Point and Chiefs Island. And again, the flat top rocks are seabird nesting colonies and you can see the, the kelp on both sides of the, uh, the, the point here. On the north coast, this is uh, Cape Foulweather, and note the whitewashed cliffs. This is one of the largest pelagic cormorant nesting colonies in the state. We've had up to 475 nests at this one site. This is a little bit more vertical view, and you can see the, the kelp bed that's right offshore from, uh, from the headland here. Cape Lookout, further north, nice uh, kelp beds uh, along the south face uh, towards land there. Three Arch Rocks National Wildlife Refuge near Cape Mears. You can see the, the marine algae so out here, the dark color. And then um, all the way up at Ecola Point and Sea Line Rock. Again, uh, kelp beds near the rocky areas here. 
So tonight I'm going to talk about uh, birds that utilize kelp forest. And uh, some of our birds, like common moors you see here, are strictly coastal or marine. They're in the salt water all the time. Other birds come here for the winter and spend the winter in the coast uh, on the salt water and breed inland and freshwater during other times of the year. And some migrate from the Arctic all the way to, the, to South America and uh, use a variety of coastal, estuarine, and freshwater wetlands. So we don't have any kelp-specific birds like spotted owls and ancient forest, but we have birds that utilize a variety of habitats, and all these habitats are important uh, for them to sustain themselves through the year. And so they use these different habitats in space and time, and kelp forests are one of those habitats that can provide uh, really good resources to them when in really needy times. So one of the species you you would see if you spent time looking at kelp forests are pelagic cormorants. And most people think they're black birds, but when you get them in the right light, their iridescence is just beautiful. Um, when John James Audubon made it to the West Coast, he saw these birds and he called them violet green cormorants, which I think is a much better name than uh, pelagic cormorant. Uh, now, this is a kelp forest uh, up near uh, Depot Bay, uh, Otter Rock. And one of the things on the central coast here, north coast, is it's tough to get photos of birds and kelp at any close range because the kelp forest is far enough offshore that it doesn't make for great photography. But I want you to look at this area right here. And the next photo shows this bird. And if you're a really good birder, you know that's a cormorant. I know it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but that's a pelagic cormorant. And I watched this bird and it dove a couple times in this open area and I thought, okay, now it's gonna move outside and move along. And it continued to dive and dive and dive and dive in the same location. So apparently it was finding uh, fish or crabs uh, that was liking there. And so it must've been a, a good foraging spot because it did not go elsewhere. It stayed here as long as I, I watched it. And here's uh, another area. And we have both pelagic and branch cormorants foraging among the uh, kelp forest here and of course, you know, kelp forests harbor all kinds of different species of fish and particularly juvenile fish, which uh, these birds can, can target. And pelagic cormorants, like all cormorants, they regurgitate directly into the mouths of the young. So we can't really tell what they're feeding their young. It's transferred out of our sight. But if you watch uh, cormorants, like pelagic cormorants close enough, you can get an idea on what they're, they're foraging on. And they're pretty opportunistic. This one, uh, as a small cabazon. And of course they turn it head first and immediately try to swallow it. And they gotta be quick because if a gull sees them, they're attacked and they got a battle for their, the fish they caught. Uh, here's a, a shaghorn sculpin trying to do its best to prevent being swallowed, but it almost never works. The, the birds are pretty good at handling them. And they do feed on a variety of crabs. And this happens to be a, a Dungeness crab. And the only way they can eat these things is that they have to remove all the legs first and then they swallow the body whole. <clears throat> and if you look closely here, this is the crab body going down. So a big gulp. Brant's cormorant is a, uh, the second species of cormorant, a strictly marine cormorant on the Oregon coast. You see those nice white plumes that stick out the side of its uh, neck. And they also have them in the back. And this is only present during the breeding season when they get this bright guler area that really is uh, almost kind of a fluorescent blue. Here you see a bunch of males trying to attract females to their potential nest site. There's one pair of birds in the upper right, but the rest are males trying to attract females. We, we can't separate them by plumage. We just know that the males initiate the nest and try to attract a female. And they use a variety of vegetation to construct their nests. And many times, uh, They'll go to the headlands and strip vegetation to make, uh, make their nesting materials. And, uh, but many times they also use marine algae and kelp. And this is the, the colony just off to the right here. And these birds only have to fly maybe 100, 200 meters. And they're in dense algae uh, pulling this up. And it's really fun to watch because it's just a continual train of cormorants moving back and forth, um, picking up this material and carrying these heavy loads back back to their nest sites. So here's a case where the, the kelp forest, the structure is actually providing uh, habitat for these birds for their, for their nests. And they continue to build these nests even after the eggs laid at some point they decide, okay, I guess we, we got quite enough here. 
And these, these uh, Brant's cormorants, they're the size of the young as they approach uh, time to fledge, they can, they can be the same uh, weight or exceed the weight of the adult. So they're, they're really little gluttonous things, they're, they're ravenous. And here you see this young has his head totally buried in the mouth of this cormorant. And if you look at this little, little point right here, that's its bill poking out the backside of its neck, neck as it's trying to, uh, trying to be fed. So it gives me a sore throat to think about that. Pigeon guillemots are a very social bird and oftentimes they'll sit in these groups near their breeding sites. So you can see maximum numbers uh, just uh, adjacent to where they're breeding. And they're, they're very social birds. They have great displays. These birds are a pair singing, singing to each other. Uh, likewise, these birds as well. And they have really elaborate flights, both for courtship and for battling others who are trying to uh, move in on their, on their potential mate. <clears throat> And sometimes, you know, you just have to show off for your partner to, to show them that you got the right stuff. Typically, uh, uh, pigeon guillemots nest in cracks and crevices of, ro of rocks, which protect them from predation, predation by gulls and crows and, uh, and ravens. And so you see a, an adult guillemot sitting here. It's hard to see, but there's a white looking bird here. That's a, the young bird. And of course, this plagiocormoran is whitewashing the whole area to make it a little bit confusing. Uh, some of these uh, areas are pretty precarious, at least for photographers. There's a, there's a nest in this crack and there's another one in this one. And these birds are hanging out. And this is the entrance to one of those, those nests, which uh, kind of gives me, uh, kind of hurts my legs just thinking about hanging on there. We also have found them nesting in sandbanks along beach areas, which was kind of surprising at first because we think of them mostly as ro around rocky areas, but they up high underneath the vegetation, uh, they dig these uh, sand, sand burrows. And so you can see them sometimes in sandy areas. They also use uh, a lot of artificial structure. They nest under bridges, under uh, piers, things like that. So you can see them uh, in estuaries. One of our, uh, one big site for breeding uh, is Cape Foulweather. And here they're actually using rock boulders that have fallen from the cliffs. There's big boulder piles here, here, a really big pile right here, and uh, down in this area. And uh, we've counted up to 150 or so of pigeon guillemots in this area. And of course you can see the kelp beds right here and they extend all the way out and the birds actively feed right in this area. So they don't have to go far from, from their breeding site to be foraging uh, for fish in, among these, uh, the kelp forest here. And they, they carry fish in their bill back to, they typically have two young where most houses only have one. And so if you're in their route back to their nest, you can get an idea what sort of species they're are feeding on. This is a English sole, last one was a sculpin. Uh, this is Pacific sand lance. <clears throat> and from my observations, I found that some of these birds at, at specific nest sites target a single species of fish. They apparently learn where these fish are and, and how to easily get them. And they continually bring back the same species where their neighbor right next door is totally feeding on a different, uh, different species of fish. And I'm not exactly sure what species of fish this is, but it uh, looks like it inhabits perhaps a rocky intertidal area or subtidal. <clears throat> Common murr is our most abundant seabird species in Oregon. Uh, you see them nesting in huge, dense colonies uh, all along the, the Oregon coast. And they, have, they lay a single egg, have a single chick, and they bring a, one fish back at a time to their young. And so, Oregon State University has a long-term monitoring project at Yakuna Head where they're recording what fish are being brought back. They know the length of the bill of the adult so they can estimate the length of the fish and they can sometimes get it to species specific or to a group of fish such as smelts or that sort of thing. But it's pretty fun to watch these flocks coming back. Sometimes you'll see 15, 20 birds and they all have this little tail sticking out of their mouth as they bring fish back to their young. This adult is feeding its chick uh, uh, some species of surf perch, which you'd expect to see around kelp beds. And MERS are a little bit different than other birds. So when it's time to 
for the young to leave, which is only three weeks, three weeks of age. They're very small downy birds. The dad takes over total care and they go to sea. So here you see the little chick right here. That's his dad and the chick's jumping off and hopefully it clears all the rocks and makes it down. And they go to sea for another six to eight weeks uh, of rearing. And um, during this time, it can be really critical because the adult can no longer fly to the food supply. They have to swim to it and keep their young nearby. And consequently, uh, there's high mortality of young during this early period where they're trying to reach fledging age along the coast and, and learn how to forage for themselves. Oftentimes, food supply becomes scarce locally. And so um, I think during this period, uh, we often see MERS with their young really close to shore, sometimes an estuary. And I think during these periods when they cannot find abundant forage fish offshore, that kelp force might play an important role on sustaining these young long enough to, uh, to uh, make it to uh, fledgling. And once they're a year old or so, they, they are really long live birds. It's just that first six months, it's really tough on these guys. These are rhinoceros oclets. <clears throat> Mostly a uh, highly fledged seabird. We have low numbers that nest along the Oregon coast, but oftentimes you see them near headlands and locations where they don't breed. And this is a pair that's courting about 200 yards off of Yaquinta Head where we don't know of any birds nesting there. And uh, so I, first when I was thinking about this bird, I said, well, do they really use kelp force? And then just last week I was out at an area watching a kelp force and there was a rhinoceros oclet repeatedly diving and forging in a kelp force. And it was a, a juvenile bird, a first year bird. So um, it may well be that it's important specifically to, to young birds. And then this is another long distance shot. Hot birders will know that this is a grebe, but for the rest of you it might be tough to tell, but I watched this bird repeatedly uh, forging in the kelp here. And this is a juvenile red-necked uh, grebe. And this is, if you could get up really close, this is what a juvenile redneck grebe looks like. It's kind of a, it's not a small grebe, it's not a large grebe, it's kind of in between size. Then we also see um, horn grebes foraging uh, in kelp force. And this is a, what a win winter plumage bird looks like. And then they leave the Oregon coast and head inland to breed in freshwater. They have, this is one of the grebes that has really spectacular plumage when they, uh, when they depart the area. And this is, this is what they look like in their breeding plumage. So looks like a totally different bird um, when they're in breeding plumage. Western grebes, uh, we see these all along the coastline and near and around uh, kelp beds. Uh, these are our largest grebe. And note in this fo photo that the red eye is located inside the black feathers on the, the cap of the head. And the bill color is kind of a more of a greenish color. Uh, here's a different angle. What I was trying to show you here is their feet. They, uh, and as opposed to having web feet uh, like um, like waterfowl or loons, that sort of thing, they have big lobes on their toes for for swimming. And you can see how far back their legs are located on their their body. They're built for swimming, and so it's very difficult for these birds to walk on land. They have to stand totally upright, and they don't they don't go very far from the water. So there's a second species of grebe that's very similar. This is a Clark's grebe. And here, note that the bill is yellow, almost going to an orange color. And that red eye is located in the white feathers below the cap. And that's one way to separate this bird from, from the Western grebe. And it's less abundant than the Western grebe, but they indeed are present here. And here's just a comparison of the two. The one at the top is the Clark's. You can easily see the the red eye and the white there and a brighter color bill. Also notice that it's much wider on the flank here than, than a Western grebe. Um, so we have three species of loons along the Oregon coast. Uh, this is the common loon. And um, one, the common loon and Pacific loons are ones more likely to see uh, in or around kelp beds. This is a bird that's in uh, winter plumage. So uh, rather, rather uh, dull colored, but uh, in breeding plumage, they get these really beautiful dark green head and this green stripe around its throat and uh, really pretty nice looking birds. We don't get to see a whole lot of them here because that's their, they're leaving here and they're transitioning from winter pl uh, plumage to, to breeding plumage. And they can eat quite large fish. And um, 
which makes it easy for us because they have to handle them quite a while before they can swallow it. So we can get an idea. And of course, if you know fish at all, this is easy to tell it's a starry flounder. But what was amusing is to watch this loon try to swallow it. It, it really had to work with it. And eventually was able to fold that fish enough to, to get it down. And of course, oftentimes they'll be attacked by gulls. So they got to dive underwater, come back up, start all over again. And uh, loons also eat crabs, and uh, this is a small crab. It's it's removed the legs because those are tiny little sharp things that won't do your uh, your system very good. And uh, so they swallow them whole. And I've seen them swallow some really really large crabs after they remove the legs. It looks like they really have to work to to get them down. It's pretty amazing. So you might not find Dungeness crab in a kelp forest, but you'd find things like uh, rock crabs or uh, decorator crabs or things like that, kelp crabs. And having productive habitats year round is really essential for these birds. This is a, a common loon that's arrived here. It's in, in uh, what we'd call uh, winter plumage. And, um, but they completely molt, they have a catastrophic molt of their wing feathers. So they go completely flightless during the, during the winter time. And so they've got to have re resources nearby because where, whatever they're going to exploit, they have to swim to. So, that's why it's important to have all these different healthy habitats, uh, both in estuary, coastal, uh, kelp forest, to provide for these birds in, during these critical periods. And you see the, the, the primary feathers are just trying to, just starting to erupt out of the sheaths on the wing. And this photo is taken by John Bragg down at Coos Bay, uh, brown pelicans. And if you've been on the coast the last two years, we've had really, really good numbers of pelicans all along the Oregon coast the past two years. Uh, they breed in Southern California and Mexico during the late winter and in the spring and summer they come up all the way up through Washington and some even British Columbia in big numbers and oftentimes you'll see them feeding their their um, kilt beds like this. And at one time this was a threatened species but uh, it's totally totally recovered. It's been protected and it's doing doing quite well. It does not nest here. And right now is when they begin to leave to head back to, uh, to warmer, warmer, less wet climates. And galls also forage in uh, kelp forests and they may be picking up uh, plankton, small invertebrates, krill. Um, they potentially could capture small fish. Uh, this is a Western gall. The top two birds, the Western gall and the and the glaucous wing gull are the two birds that we have nesting along the Oregon coast. And we're on the southern end of the glaucous wing gull range and the northern end of the western gull range, range. And consequently, these two species freely hybridize. So most of the birds in the central and north coast of Oregon are probably hybrids of these two species. Uh, but th these are the birds that nest here and are here year round. And there's a variety of other birds. I've just shown a few that come here during the non breeding season ringbill gull on the left. California gull, mu gull, and there's, there's a whole list of other uh, species of gulls that we can see here as well. And one of my favorite uh, waterfowl uh, is the harlequin duck. The males are really spectacularly plumaged and uh, they strictly eat marine invertebrates. Uh, when they go up and nest, which they nest on high of free flowing high mountain streams. So from the Cascades all the way to Montana, Wyoming, Utah, and there they feed on aquatic invertebrates and insects. So they rarely eat any vegetation. Just a really, really nice plumage. And they, they have a great little, little voice. If you ever want to see these birds, the best place to go is the Yaquina Bay South Jetty. Uh, they're there from July to, to late April. And when I first, I, I've seen these birds feeding and I, at first I thought they were eating the marine algae, which kind of went with the, against the, the wisdom of them feeding primarily on invertebrates. But as I watched them, they're not actually eating the algae, they're gleaning invertebrates from the algae or from the rock itself. And uh, so it's really, really fun to watch them doing this if you can get close to them. And so I told you they nest on these, these mountain streams. So they go up there in May and once the female is sitting on her clutch, the males are done with uh, 
done with their their part and they come right back to the coast so the, at the end of the first week of june they start arriving uh in mass back at the coast and they immediately begin start molting into their summer plumage and um so you see these birds are in intertidal uh, all this marine uh, uh marine algae and there's a kelp bed right offshore this is a great place for these birds to undergo this this molt because they're like that loom picture i showed you they're going to completely lose all their flight feathers and be flightless for at least three weeks, maybe four. And as I watched these birds, it was just continual feathers flying everywhere. These, all three of these birds are males. They're starting to fade pretty seriously. And here, here again, all three males, you can see they look pretty darn ratty. This is in peak molting time where they're getting rid of their, their breeding plumage and going to um, their summer plumage. And so really high energy requirements. They need they need great habitat nearby. They can't fly, so it's got to be close by. And so areas like this adjacent to kelp beds are just perfect for, for this species. And this is this is uh, uh, at Otter Rock there where the Marine Garden is and the uh, Marine Reserve just offshore. And believe it or not, this is a male harlequin duck uh, during the peak of the summertime. And one, the easiest way to tell it's a male is those white feathers on it, the secondary feathers on its wing, the female doesn't have that. Otherwise, you'd have to look really closely to say, is this a male or is this a female? So pretty dramatic uh, change. And this is another photo that uh, John Bragg shot, and it shows a great egret uh, walking on the kelp forest and foraging. This is a rather unique, unique photo. I, I was shocked when I saw it. and. Uh, I think this was taken near Yoakum Point inside of Coos Bay. It's very flat, calm, and very dense. I, I have not seen great egrets foraging on the outer coastline. I see them flying up and down the coastline. coastline. They forage in estuaries, behind the dunes and freshwater, but I've never seen them actually foraging right on the, on the beach area. But um, this is a nice, dense uh, uh, kelp forest here. But we do have great blue herons all along the coast uh, exploiting uh, rock intertidal areas, areas adjacent to kelp beds. Um, I recently photographed two great blue herons fighting over the rights to forage for fish in this, uh, this one intertidal area. So that's the species that you'll see nearby in these productive habitats. And then we have several species of, they're called shorebirds. They're, these are phalaropes, these are uh, redneck phalaropes. But the interesting thing is during their migration, most of their migration and all winter, they stay out to sea, which is pretty amazing for a small bird like this. So these are migrating from the Arctic to South America. This is a juvenile during its first uh, migration. And so they're primarily feeding on plankton that they find and uh, this next you'll see the breeding plumage. So you, we'd expect to see these in adjacent to kelp beds. Uh, I see them in all different types of habitats, but um, food requirements are very high. This is the second species. You'll, this is a red phalarope winter plumage. You note the, the entire gray back and the yellow on the bill. It's shorter, uh, uh, thicker bill. And in breeding plumage, there are no, no mistaking this bird for, for what it is, really, really nice plumage. So we see these feeding around uh, marine algae. And here you can see this bird uh, going around. And, and apparently the, the algae causes either plankton to ga uh, gather around the, the, the uh, algae, or more likely, the change in currents is causing uh, turnover of the water, which brings uh, plankton to the surface. So you see these birds swimming around and, and pecking. So this is a single strand of bull kelp, and it's located five and a half miles west of Newport. So it's just a single strand, but it's providing uh, foraging habitat for these uh, redneck phalaropes. And again, either plankton is attracted to the kelp, or more likely it's causing a change in currents, which is like a little miney, minor upwelling and bringing bringing a plankton to the surface. And as I watched, these birds circled and circled and circled the strand. Of feeding. So uh, once kelp starts to leave the kelp forest, it still has value for, for birds. And of course, when it ends up on the beach, it's often in these huge, huge wads of, of kelp that are all twisted together. Um, they, they, these, these, some of these things are, you can't move them, they weigh hundreds of pounds. And uh, 
but it provides great organic material as it breaks down to a variety of invertebrates that uh, live in the sand. And uh, it also provides essential nutrients to this rather, uh, the sand area that's devoid of, of much nutrient. And so those nutrients help, uh, help provide, if you will, a fertilizer for plants that grow high on the beach or in the low four dune area. And so we get these big wads. They also harbor lots of invertebrates under them. And it's kind of tough to see here, but on the left side of this, this kelp, there's a lot of tracks here and you see all these little holes and divots. And so a wimbrel was going back and forth feeding here. And there were also gull tracks uh, uh, right along the edge of the kelp uh, feeding. So I have a little quick video here and I wanted to show you what's underneath this uh, vegetation that's laying on the beach. So this is a small piece of sea palm, maybe 18 inches tall, it's rapidly decomposing. And I have a small garden, uh, garden tool that I'm gonna move it with, it's, that's about the width of my hand for size. And you'll note the number of beach hoppers or, or some people call them sand fleas that are located underneath that are great food for, for birds, particularly things like snowy plovers and semi-palmated plovers. So there's three different little groups here that I, I move. So you can imagine what's underneath those those two or three or four hundred pound wads of, of uh, kelp, and uh, and these amphipods are fed on fed fed on by a number of birds. And when you get into wetter areas, uh, then you get other species of invertebrates, bloodworms, and different things that oops, sorry, other birds are feeding on. This is a really old decaying uh, bit of kelp, and these are um, short-billed dowitchers that I watched them actively feeding, moving all around this little, little piece of uh, vegetation. And at some point, they all panicked, and the rest flew away, and I, it must have been a close approach of a raptor that spooked them. But these two came back, and they fed all around it. They climbed on top of it. They feed around it. And, it was almost like kids in a candy shop. They would walk away maybe a foot or two and then they'd run back and start feeding again. And did that over and over again until I kind of got bored and moved along. But uh, they're really attracted to the invertebrates that were uh, in and around this decaying kelp. And this is a Western sandpiper uh, feeding around the vegetation. Really any shorebird you see along the beach, you see them doing this, uh, Dunlin, Sandlings, uh, Lee Sandpipers. Uh, they're really attracted to this material on the beach because it harbors really good food supply uh, for, for them. And uh, in some cases, it provides uh, a camouflage. And this is a snowy plover, and uh, they spend their almost their entire lives on the beach. And obviously, they're vulnerable to predation by uh, peregrine falcons or merlins. And uh, so they often find uh, something to hide by while they're sleeping or resting. And in this case, uh, it's uh, bull kelp. And other cases could be shells or, or other vegetation, but um, it's really important for them to stay, stay hidden because there are these predators hunting the beaches uh, every day. And uh, again, this is another snowy plover uh, located behind bull kelp. Um, I'm not sure, but I think its other eye might be closed. And if so, this bird is practicing unihemispheric slow wave sleep, which is they can shut one eye and totally turn that side of the brain off and keep the other eye open and aware and uh, looking for, for trouble. So, but that's a story for, for another day. That was great. I love that. Thanks, Roy. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to put it in the chat Q&A box. Um, I'll just say that when I, I went diving in 
Port Orford at Redfish Rocks on Saturday with a group for the Laka Alliance. And there were lots of birds. Um, and I am not too uh, keen on my bird knowledge. So this was very helpful for that for next time when I go out. We did see some cormorants, I knew that much. Um, but the, the black cormorant with the iridescent feathers was so beautiful. I love that photo. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, Let's see. Laura said, what a fascinating talk and spectacular photos. Thank you so much, Roy, not just for this talk, but for all that you have done for the Oregon coast. Thanks, so Laura. Great. Yeah. Uh, what kind of camera do you use? I'm assuming you have a good telephoto lens for that. Yeah, not a terribly big one. I, I'm using Canon gear, uh, a, Mark, a Mark V, um, and I have a 100 to 400 lens and I have an extender on it which is a 1.4. So um, that's kind of the bare minimum to reach out there. The, the whole thing about this photography is getting really close to the birds. Um, you can see when, when I was photographing birds out in the kelp, it's, you know, it, they're not very good pictures. You, it's documentation of what's there, but, you know, you would need a 600 millimeter lens with the 2.0 and then you might, you know, get better. But um, uh, yeah, so that's what I'm using. It's Canon with a, a 1 to 400 and a 1.4 extender. Great. Uh, Brian asks, when is the best time of year to see tufted puffins at Face Rock near Bandon? They arrive in early April, but the best time to see them, I would say, would be like uh, May through July. And, you know, there's not many there, but you can't on the south coast. That's one of the better places to see them. So you just have to be a little patient. I would go uh, early and late. Once you get into July, they would be feeding young, carrying fish, so they could be coming uh, all day long coming and going and of course the other great location is haystack rock at Cannon beach yeah i still have yet to see them one day um bob hi bob asks can you talk about black brant and eelgrass and eelgrass beds and estuaries yeah a very timely question because i just watched a webinar earlier today from osu about the the decline and disappearance of eelgrass in our estuaries, uh, which really alarmed me because Brant, Black Brant, Pacific Black Brant feed strictly on eelgrass. That's really all they eat. And sometimes in the spring, they'll start to feed on ulva type of algae, but they're really specific to, to, um, to eelgrass. And we no longer have a wintering population of Brant at Coos Bay, which we did historically. And Last year, we, we followed them pretty closely at Yaquina Bay. We could not come up with more than 91 birds uh, on any one day. And Yaquina Bay used to winter about 400 birds. And Tillamook and Neatarts are also places where we have wintering brant. But if we lose that eelgrass, uh, those brant, I guess, are going to go elsewhere. But they're very, we, we, we watch marked birds and they're very specific. The birds at Yaquina Bay are here every year. We've got some really good information on that. So. That, that's a real concern that, that, and that's such a productive habitat also for fish and invertebrate. It's not just, not just waterfowl. Wow, we are getting lots of questions in now. Everybody was holding out on me in the beginning. All right, um, Lynn asks, how is the food sources and the kelp beds in the winter time? If you know that question. I don't know that question. I don't, and I don't know of people that are doing that kind of research of people are diving. It's, it's, I know you went diving the other day and it wasn't that rough, but still the surge and stuff, trying to be out there and, and, and documenting that in wintertime is really, really tough, really dangerous. So I don't have that information. I know a, a fair amount of the kelp starts breaking away in the wintertime as well, so. Yeah, there, uh, we did see black rockfish. We only saw about two fish while we were diving, but it was also like, you know, 15 to 20, feet surges so we we're just on the side of a pinnacle floating back and forth um but there is a uh, work research being done on rockfish and their patterns and redfish rocks i know that they're doing out there um but yeah that was a good question uh let's see kimber asks how far inland do harlequin ducks go for mountain streams uh just the coast range or do they go further inland Oh no, we, in fact, there's, there's very few documented in the coast range. There's, there's a few documentations. The, the nearest would be the Cascades. And in the Oregon Cascades, I think we're talking about hundreds of birds. So um, 
they, they're going much farther inland into Montana, Idaho, Utah, British Columbia, um, probably Washington Cascades. At Yaquinta Bay, three years in a row, we had a marked individual that had a color band and it was banded at McDonald Creek in Glacier National Park. And it was here three years in a row. So we knew this was its wintering site and it would go back there. So uh, they, co they go pretty far inland. And it, it's these high mountain fast flowing streams. So that's another reason it's my favorite bird. I love that habitat and I love their rocky coastline habitat as well. Uh, do you know how many different types of kelp there are on the Oregon coast? I could probably help if you don't. Well, I think the only the two primary ones are, which is mostly bull kelp. And what's the other one at, uh, at uh, Cape Arago, the small patch of that, the, the broadleaf one? There's um, giant kelp. Giant kelp, yeah. And reef, yeah, that's the only place you'll find it. Uh, they're also um, the smaller kelp that don't necessarily reach the surface, which are sea palms and palm kelp too. Um, but the bull kelps are the ones that grow all the way to the top that you see. They kind of look like there might be otters there with their bulbs hanging out, but uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's what's. I know, I'm like, oh, I wish that was an otter. <laughs> uh, I keep looking at it, some of those sites where I show those dense eelgrass, I mean, not eelgrass, but uh, kelp beds. You could just envision an otter laying on its back with its, with its pup. <laughs> I know. That's our goal, right, people? All right. Uh, um, let's see, I guess a good one after that question is, why is bull kelp only found around rocky areas? Well, it, it has a, attached to a hard substrate, so um, it can attach to sand. And it, I mean, because it's undergoing a lot of stress because it can be 100 feet tall and it's, you know, flown in a wave. So it has to be anchored really good. So it anchors to the hard surface of rocks and you, you don't have that in sand. So. Yes, correct. Gold star on that answer. Uh, and the southern Oregon coast is where the most rocky reef is. Um, and the whole 363 miles of coastline in Oregon. So that's where uh, Seattle waters most likely will, will be released because there's a lot of kelp down there. Uh, let's see. Um, so Claire asks, presumably with the return of sea otters and kelp forests elsewhere, uh, there will be increases in some of these birds populations or any predictions in that sense? I don't have any predictions other than to say that, you know, having more of habitat that's productive with fish populations is going to benefit these species and how you would, how you'd measure that would be really difficult because these birds exploit so many different environments, but it, it really might be the difference of whether a young bird survives its first, uh, first summer, first fall and that sort of thing. So uh, we know when we produce more quality habitats, it's good for good for all fish and wildlife, but that'd be a tough one to measure. Mm -hmm. um, Diane thought it was fascinating about how uh, the loons and the picos, um, I don't know what that stands for, but sure you do, um, how they eat. <laughs> There you go, plagic cormorant. <laughs> uh, ate the crabs by removing the crab legs. That was fascinating. I, I know I the first time I saw that, I went, oh my gosh. Well, it makes sense because, uh, you know, those those feet are going to do severe damage and you wouldn't be yeah. able to swallow that. But it's pretty amazing to see because the loons I saw swallowing some really big crabs and it's like stretching as hard as they could to get it down. And I just don't know how that whole works, how they can dissolve those things. and. It's really amazing. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about that when you showed, you could see the crab in the neck of the bird. <laughs> and I was like, man, they must have some good digestive juices to <laughs> break down that shell. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Barbara asks, will Coos County ever get another chance to designate an MPA or MRA so that we can fill the only gap in marine reserves and marine protected areas along the entire coast of our state? Well, I can't answer that question, but I think it would be a really good, I think it would be a really good thing to do. I, I you know, I'm, I'm glad we made the headway that we did with the Marine Reserves, but we really need, we really need more and larger ones to, to really have a good system. So I, I would support that, but that's nothing in my purview. That'd be a whole state process. Yeah, that would be wonderful, but it would take probably a very long time. Um, 
uh, are kelp beds important for marbled murrelets? That's a good question. I, <clears throat> I don't have any personal observation of them, but I could, I could very well see them there because during the, during the um, breeding season, they're really near shore. They're basically on, on the backside of waves, so they don't extend far out to sea. Later in the winter, they do, you do find them farther offshore. So I could, I could definitely see where they would be, uh, but I have, I, have not, I have not seen that myself. That'd be a good question for someone like Kim. At, uh, um, Kim Nelson. Let's see if you know the answer to this. What would otters feed on if they were reintroduced on the Oregon coastline? Uh, probably what they feed on elsewhere is things like urchins, which destroy kelp beds. Uh, other other species of crabs, um, clams. Uh, you know, they're basically invertebrate feeders. They feed on some fish, but it's mostly marine invertebrates. So, um, and most people may not know we've had these huge expansion of these of these um, urchin beds that have been really really devastating to other organisms. And uh, California's seen it, Northern California, and that basically was a result of losing sea stars, which was the last remaining real predator of urchins. And so um, getting otters back would be a great start on trying to knock back um, urchins. Um, perfect. Yes, lots of invertebrates. Uh, Laura asks, have you seen, is it eider or eater? Eider. In the UK? Uh, that's an extremely rare bird in Oregon. So one bird shows up maybe every two or three years. So it's not a, they, they pretty much stay up north. So it takes a lot of effort for one to end up down here. Eiders pretty much stay circumpolar. Um, but occasionally, we, you know, an eider will make it down. And when it does, uh, birders are flocking from all over the place to, to see it. And I, the last one I can remember is maybe three years ago, a king eider in, uh, off of Newport. Perfect. Well, I think that's that was all the questions. Um, you have lots of affirmations in the chat and thank Thanks. yous for all your knowledge and sharing your stunning photographs. Thank I you. definitely learned a lot. I think we all did too today. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're gonna be, you know, have a nice keen eye next time we're on the coast to look at these birds. Yes, and Remember what you said. Uh, okay. Perfect. Well, Great. we've got a couple of minutes to spare. So um, thanks again for joining us tonight. Yes. And don't forget to join us for our next webinar on December 1st. You can learn all about the bull kelp, kelp journey on the Pacific coast over the years. It should be really, really beautiful, fascinating uh, art and photography with um, Josie on that one. And yeah, with that, anything you'd like to say, Roy, to close things out? I oh, just appreciate people spending uh, the evening with us and uh, I hope they'll get out to see some of these birds because it's it's really fun it's really fantastic and and uh, always great to see them in person perfect all right thanks everyone have a great evening thanks Chanel <laughs>